personal freedom, political liberty, and free speech. Defended by force of arms, if necessary, welcome to the Resistance Library from Ammo.com, where we believe that arming our fellow Americans, both physically and philosophically, helps them fulfill our Founding Fathers' intent with the Second Amendment to serve as a check on state power. Hello, everybody. It's Molly and Sam here today at the Resistance Library. We've got a special topic for you, one I'm sure a lot of folks feel strongly about, myself included. Pretty sure Sam might have a strong opinion or two. Um, what we're going to be discussing is based on an article Sam recently published at our uh, ammo.com resistance library. Uh, you can find the link for that when you're done in the description of this podcast. Um, and it's regarding the history of the ATF. Um, and before we get started, just a quick disclaimer. I want to say that both Sam and I know that the actual name of the agency is the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. We're just using ATF because it's short and convenient. Um, so keep that in mind. You don't have to tell us that we're not, um, calling it the right thing. We know. <laughs> um, so the ATF, Sam, I'm going to let you take the ball on this one. Why don't you give our listeners a brief description of what the agency is and what their role is supposed to look like or what we think their roles should look like. So, yeah, I think bat fee would actually be a funny thing to call them, but, uh, we're just going to call them <laughs> the ATF on this cause it's kind of what everybody um, knows them as. I don't know that there's going to be, I know that alphabet organizations are real popular among the listeners of the resistance library podcast and their favorite among them is almost certainly going to be, uh, the ATF. That is sarcasm for anyone who wasn't picking it up despite how thick I was laying it on. Uh, the ATF gave us, of course, the siege at Ruby Ridge, the siege of Waco, um, Fast and Furious scandal, the 1986 um, Firearms Act that uh, banned automatic weapons. Um, they basically got the automatic weapon ban in there because uh, it was a, it was horse trading to rein in the ATF, who had spent most of their post-prohibition um, era existence in trapping otherwise legally um, you know, law-abiding gun owners. Um, with obscure twists and turns of um, federal gun law, you know, I don't, I don't know that there is a more corrupt uh, federal organization that uh, I'm aware of um, than the ATF. And the funny thing is, they're not even really popular um, in Washington. Is the thing, you know, like there's if there's never any shortage of money in Washington for alphabet agencies to patrol and surveil you and uh, hem in your rights uh, through death by a thousand cuts. Well, there is a shortage of cash for the ATF. Um, they have <laughs> been on a funding freeze. Um, I don't know since how long, but yeah, they don't, they haven't had their budget increase in a while. And, a, and, and a, a budget freeze is a budget cut because Salaries go up every year. Rents go up every year. Uh, costs increase every year, even for federal alphabet agencies. Um, there have been bills introduced to break them up. Uh, this is not, you know, uh, none of this is normal for a, an alphabet agency, which usually, for all intents and purposes, seem to have blank checks in Washington. Um, not the ATF. And so... Um, I think that it's worth kind of, you know, drilling down into why even the people who have endless amounts of money for any organization who wants to take our rights away, uh, th why is there no money? Why do they not want to give more money to these guys specifically? Because it is that part is completely anomalous among uh, the alphabet agencies that there's not just like, sure. What do you need boys, uh, attitude towards them in Washington, but quite the opposite. Um, well, before, before we go there, let's, let's rewind a little bit. So sure. I, there were some interesting things in your article, right? Um, I thought I didn't, I didn't know much about the ATF of the, uh, the history of the ATF previous to the early nineties when, you know, I, 
I, I remember things, Ruby Ridge, Waco. So I was real intrigued. There's a couple things here. Um, and I don't know which one you want to talk on first. I was real intrigued by the idea that the ATF was originally um, part of the Treasury Department. So how do we, I want you to walk us through how we get from an uh, agency that starts with the Treasury Department to an organization that we have today that somehow combines uh, firearms with alcohol and tobacco. Because uh, as Americans, uh, and, and really most Americans would say as people, regardless of nationality, um, we believe in the right to self-defense, right? Our constitution specifically says we have the right to keep and bear arms that shall not be infringed, yet we have this agency that does just that. And then it pairs it up with things like alcohol and tobacco. And while I like my whiskey, I that's not the same thing to me as a firearm. They're completely, philosophically, they, they're completely different. Um, so kind of, can you give us the history of how we go from the prohibition, original ATF, obviously it wasn't the ATF at that point, but this division of the Treasury Department to this organization we have today that has combined things that I see as irrelevant to one another. So uh, this is kind of one of the weird things about the ATF. And believe me, you know, I am, I am a teetotaler. I do not drink a drop, uh, but I don't know what's more American than alcohol, tobacco, firearms, and explosives. It sounds like the 4th of July to me. Um, so anyway, they, how did they all get together? I mean, this is the thing when I was a kid that I always thought was weird, like, Alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, huh? Um, but anyway, the, the, so that's a good question. How do they all, um, you know, how do these things get grouped together? Well, they actually, the beginning of the ACF is all the way back to 1886. Uh, it was the Revenue Laboratory of the Bureau of Internal Revenue at the time. And mostly what their job was was to chase down people who weren't paying liquor tax it was they were they were just they were for chasing down bootleggers um which you know is another kind of weird antiquated thing about it because you don't think of you know bootlegging as being uh, quite the profitable operation than it that it used to be but yeah it was you know people were bootleggers in the 1880s um and that was you know if you weren't paying your stamp tax on your shine the revenue laboratory was going to come after you um, so that's kind of how they get their start. Then, of course, when prohibition starts, they become part of the Bureau of Prohibition, which was a part of the Bureau of Internal Revenue. Um, the Bureau of Prohibition then got spun off as an, an ind independent agency within the Treasury Department in 1927. Uh, it was moved to the Justice Department in 1930 and eventually moved, merged into the FBI very, very briefly in 1933, and that represents the end of uh, Prohibition. Well, that's when the Prohibition Bureau becomes the alcohol tax unit of the Bureau of Internal Revenue. So it's moved back to moved back to Treasury, um, and same as before, they're 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 there to you know chase down bootleggers, which again is um, a much more profitable business, uh, you know, especially in a world where like I mean, forget about. Um, the tax implications, you know, maybe, maybe you just like moonshine and you can't go to BevMo or, you know, Costco and get some kind of craft moonshine to drink. Um, you buy moonshine from the, you know, your uncle or whatever, and he's probably not paying tax on it. So they send the, the alcohol tax unit down in 1942, they get firearms laws, which were very, very, scant at the time there wasn't much in the way of firearms laws federal ones anyway in 1942 i mean to kind of backtrack a little bit you know fully automatic machine guns were legal until 1986 uh, which is which blows people's minds when you tell them this but this is absolutely fab and they're not even illegal now you just need you know you need the tax stamp uh and you ain't getting right. one for the most part, I mean, I, I know guys who have who have stamped, tax stamped um, automatic weapons, but like, yeah, they're not making new ones for the most part. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, um, they're they're doing that in the fifties. They be the Bureau of Internal Revenue becomes the Internal Revenue Service, uh, who maybe compete with 
the ATF for the favorite letter agency of listeners of the Resistance <laughs> Library podcast. Um, yeah, right. My personal favorite, while we're on April the subject, here. my personal favorite is the TSA uh, because <laughs> it's like it's like if you if you gave the DMV Gestapo powers, you got the TSA. Who doesn't love them? But anyway, um, yeah. there was another reorganization of federal alphabet agencies, the alcohol tax unit. They, they this is when they get tobacco taxes as well, and now it's the alcohol and tab- tobacco tax division, the ATTD. Uh, the 68 Gun Control Act is what makes the them into the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Division of the IRS. And they also get some jurisdiction over bombings and arson. And in 1972, they become a fully independent bureau of the Treasury Department, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Um, I don't know when explosives was added onto their name. I maybe have a note on that somewhere below. Um, and that it's when it's the 1960 or sorry, 72 when they become fully in, a fully independent bureau within the treasury department that they get me- much more um, law enforcement jurisdiction around firearms and their mission sort of shifts from, um, collecting alcohol and tobacco taxes, which, you know, the, to, the, the tobacco tax thing, um, I believe is, is more lucrative now than even than it was then, because like, you know, your $15 pack of cigarettes is like $10 of that or whatever it is, is taxes. Um, so right, that, right. you know, that, <laughs> but like alcohol tax is like, is, is, is not the thing that it used to be, but in any event, they move on, they move to, um, they move more over to patrolling uh, firearms laws. Um, and, you know, they never really have like when once they I don't know what their reputation was when they were just tax collectors. I assume that like when the ATF was. Well, who likes tax collectors? Right. That's exactly <laughs> it. Like, I'm sure like if you're a moonshiner in like Mississippi in 1960, you don't really like the people who want you to pay taxes on your moonshine. But like for most Americans, like you would never have even heard of these guys. Cause like the tax, like the tax collection division for alcohol, like who, like what, you know, how much, how much um, interaction is the average American going to, going to have with, with, with that um in their lives you know next to none um i mean there's got to be like weird 70s movies about bootleggers trying to outrun the the agency that eventually became the atf and i'm kind of surprised that i can't think of one off the top of my head because it sounds like the type of movie that i would watch um yeah but anyway, yeah, they like I don't know what their reputation was. I assume it's it's like the type of thing where yeah, if you're making moonshine, you don't like them. Um, if you're the average, you know, if you're like a if you're like a, a, a GM worker in Detroit, and I bring up the alcohol tobacco tobacco tax division to you, you're just like who? You know, you probably have, wouldn't have even heard of them um, because their their if their footprint would have been so minimal. Um, but you know, firearms is a whole other kettle of fish, um, and they do quickly get a bad reputation once they're enforcing the firearms laws. There were uh, congressional, there was a congressional investigation in the late seventies and early eighties. Um, people within the Congress, and I believe in the, yeah, there was a Senate sub subcommittee. I mean, this wasn't just some some piddling little you know, house investigation, uh, the Senate got involved in this. Um, and when the Senate is telling a federal alphabet agency that they're enforcing the laws a little too zealously, that should give everybody pause. Um, there were, there was ample evidence presented that American citizens, uh, had been charged and that, you know they're they're with th- th- uh, sort of charged uh, unlawfully or unfairly, and the Senate subcommittee in their report said, and I quote: "Based upon these hearings, it is apparent that ATF enforcement tactics made possible by current federal firearms laws are constitutionally, legally, and practically reprehensible." End quote. 
um, they basically found that most of the people that were being targeted by the ATF uh, had no idea that they were doing anything wrong. There was no malicious intent. Um, I think that, you know, not trying to get too far down this rabbit hole uh, as, a, as an aside, but I think that in general, part of why people resent federal law enforcement is because the entire um, notion that, you know, you have to be trying to do something bad to be committing a crime has gone out the window. This is a very, I mean, this is a, this is, um, has been a piece of jurisprudence since Roman times that like malicious intent is required to prove a crime. Um, the federal government does not care if you have malicious intent, um, and are happy to trip you up on some weird technicality. And the ATF were so bad about that, that the Senate called them out on it. Um, they and found- just so our listeners know, this is like, like when we talk about ATF and, and their overreach and their um, kind of abuse of power, a lot of times we go to those main events. We go to Ruby Ridge. We go to Waco. This is before all that. This is like, this is in the 80s. Like the, these big events, these mainstream events haven't even happened yet. And they're still at this point doing things that the government doesn't agree with. And and again, like you said, if you're pissing off other AT or ABC organizations, the other alphabet organizations of the government, like you got to be pretty damn bad. Right. I mean, well, it was like, it was 75% of ATF prosecutions were targeted against people who had no knowledge that they were breaking the law and had no intent to do anything criminal. And, and, and the like, you know, assuming that you think that these laws are good and I don't know what they are specifically. So I cannot specifically comment on whether or not I think that the laws at the time, you know, it's this, the, this, I guess it's the, the 68 gun control act. Um, I, which I am not off the top of my head familiar with and I'm not, um, you know, prepared to speak about the, the specifics of today. Uh, it's got gun control in it. So I, there's probably a fair bit of it that I don't like, but you know, even if you think that this is a good law, um, 75 percent of the, the prosecutions that the ATF were going for underneath it were things that should have been like, hey, buddy, you need you filled this paper out wrong or you you did this and this is in violation of a federal statute. And then, you know, buddy goes, oh, gee, sorry. I didn't mean to. Yeah. And that's kind of the I mean, it's right. not like it's there's so there's so many layers of this that like, you know, there's there's this guy who's going to go to jail. And then it's just the whole aspect of um, federal law enforcement dollars are going to patrol people who are not actually committing crimes rather than going after people who are. Um, and I think that that is like a thing that frequently gets left out when we are discussing um, federal law enforcement is that, you know, that there's, there's the whole aspect of not only are people being unfairly targeted, but there are bad men in the world who are not being targeted because someone decided that we're going to go mess with some guy who didn't fill out his paperwork. Right. Um, so in any event, yeah. What is that? Is that like, is it just incompetence or is it like, that's easier? Like it's easier to go get Joe Schmo, the local gun dealer, because he's not doing what he's supposed to do with his paperwork than it is to come after this big, this kingpin. You know, is it, I mean, do you have any, I know we don't know. I, I, I don't do you know have any I, opinion tr- on that? I try not to, you know, much as I don't try to tease out what the ballistics of a bullet are on a, based on a grainy video, um, I don't think that there's a lot to be gained by, by trying to guess at what somebody's motives are. Um, I just, who knows, you know, I tend to think that people, uh, I tend to think that people act in good faith. I think that, you know, like one of the big misconcept, big philosophical misconceptions that people have about the world is that the bad guys are sitting around a table, you know, rubbing their hands together and going, wahaha, how can I be evil? When in reality, it's like, People think that people generally think that they're the good guy and and then they do horrible things, you know, because they because they feel very empowered and righteous by the fact that they're the good guy. Um, you know, it's probably it's probably a little of both. Um, there's there's probably I think that there's no shortage of sloth and corruption in the world either. Um, but uh, there certainly is no shortage of 
self-righteousness in the world. Um, so it's probably some combination of both. But if you've ever wondered why the 1986 Gun Control Act, the name of it is the Fire, Firearms Owners Protection Firearms Owners Protection Act of 1986. Um, you think it's some Orwellian name, which I guess maybe it is, but um, you know the intent of this law is to like is to like get the ATF to back off. Um, right, to subdue them. A little. Right, to kind of put, to shorten their leash a bit. Um, it was a complete overhaul of the 68 Gun Control Act. Um, it allowed for it, great, you know, greater uh, interstate sales of long arms. You could ship ammunition to the mail. Um, it ended a lot of the record-keeping requirements on some forms of ammunition. And it um, protected transportation of otherwise illegal firearms across state lines, the safe passage that we know of today and again it you know banned fully automatic machine guns by civilians which um many people including myself would probably think was unconstitutional um but that was that was the, that was the horse trading to get all of that was like okay we're going to ban you know fully automatic machine guns as part of a trade to kind of get the um you know the ATF to 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 back off of people um and then you know, then the kind of the next chapter in the history of the <laughs> ATF is the one-two punch of Ruby Ridge in 92 and Waco in 93. Yeah, let's, um, we'll, we'll give our, our listeners just a quick recap of these. I'm sure most of them know uh, we just did a podcast uh, a couple weeks ago about Waco, so you can check that out. But start with Ruby Ridge. Um, Ruby Ridge was 1992. Um Randy Weaver was uh, him, his wife, their children. They kind of, they lived uh, in Northern Idaho. Am I right when I say Idaho? Yes. Um, And uh, they, so the wife was kind of paranoid and they were not always like homesteaders, but she had a fear of the government. She did not, uh, she was uncomfortable. So they kind of moved away from society. Um, And one thing leads to another. Randy Weaver gets in trouble for selling a shotgun. Well, um, gets in trouble get him- is less accurate than gets entrapped. I mean, he yeah, was well, like, there we go. Let's right. not. <laughs> Randy Weaver was not running a sawed off shotgun, you know, superstore Ring. in Northern yeah. Idaho. He sold a, he was in a very difficult economic position, had been, Coer- and I don't want to say he was coerced, but you know this he, he the 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 sawed off shotgun was made at the request of an ATF agent who sh- pointed to a barrel and said saw the thing off here, um, which is very much over the line of entrapment. They wanted to kind of get him on the chain so that they could use him as a snitch inside the Aryan Nations organization with whom he had been hanging out, but was not a member of, um, and had never been a member of, and no one disagrees on this. Um, what, and, and if you dig deeper, it turns out one of the reasons why he probably wasn't a member of the Aryan nations is because he hadn't been a snitch yet because that yeah. organization was nothing but cops. Uh, it was like snitches snitching on snitches by the time that they were even getting Randy Weaver involved. Um, so this right. is, again, your tax dollars at work. Um, the next time you see some, you know, gathering of clansmen or Aryan nations or whatever, uh, ask yourself how many of them you think are on the federal payroll, uh, because there's ample <laughs> evidence that particular these, uh, the, particularly with these like, you know, hey, kid, want to buy some dynamite groups uh, that, you know, a bunch of them are going to be cops. Um, Randy Weaver I think much to his credit said that he was not going to snitch for the ATF. And this is what got him in trouble, you know, because they were like, Oh, you know, whatever kid we will look the other way. Not that he's a kid, but uh, we'll look the other way at this sawed off shotgun thing. If you just report on, you know, apparently what are a bunch of federal agents within, <laughs> within the Aryan nations. Uh, and he refused and so there was just a, there was some weird stuff that's not the minutia of which is not really right. which get, worth getting into. Uh, but anyway, he he he. There was c- confusion as to what his court date was. He missed it. 
They gave him a second court date. And by this point, he just says, you know what? I'm not going because I don't trust that I'm going to get a fair shake. And it feels like a setup. It feels like it, right. This feels like a setup, and <laughs> and and like why wouldn't he think that? Um, so the marshal service came in to serve him, uh, you know, and did did what the feds do. They shot his dog. Uh, <laughs> the you know the uh, the federal yeah. dog shooters came by, and um, and it's you know whatever. I mean, it's not funny when somebody's dog is shot, but it's certainly not right. funny uh, when someone's fourteen year old son gets shot in the back. Or when somebody's wife gets shot uh, and killed through a door, Especially while holding a child, show, while she's holding their not even just their child. I think the kid was three yeah. months old. I mean, it was a little little kid. So uh, yes. you know, whatever. I mean, I think that like, sorry guys, I am gonna laugh every time we talk about a federal agent shooting a dog because it's like at this point it's such a clear like. Come on, guys, it's, get it, get a new riff. You know, like we know we know you can shoot right. dogs. Uh, show me what else you can do. But anyway, there was um, a bunch of, you know, patriots sent on the scene. Eleven days later, uh, he came out and he was tried and acquitted on all charges except for the failure to appear, which is a bit strange. But anyway, that's how it that's how it shook out. And it all starts with the ATF uh, entrapping this guy who, you know, has some weird beliefs about the world. Wife had some even weirder beliefs about the world, but having weird beliefs about the world is not a crime yet in the United States. Uh, right. And does not. And, and he was not even like, like David Koresh, which we're going to talk about in a moment. He, I mean, this was just like him and his family. Um, they had some friends, but like, they were not, there was no fear that they were hurting children. There was you there was really no fear that he was dealing illegal guns. The average listener um, of this podcast has much more in common with Randy Weaver than amen. Um, they amen. would probably immediately think. I mean, yeah, he just kind of wanted right. to do his own thing and live his life the way that he wanted to, was not hurting. With his version of the American dream. Right, and he is not hurting yeah anyone and no one accuses him of it that's the thing too is like we can go like you know if you want to debate like what was going on in mount carmel or whatever you know certainly there's there are people who again in good faith think that uh that that david koresh was abusing children at waco um this again does not require the intervention of the atf does not require the intervention of the of the fbi or any other federal agency but there are people who in good faith sure they believe that he was abusing children there um no no one accused Randy Weaver of doing anything untoward other than selling a sawed off shotgun to an agent who had been, you know, nagging him about it while he because he knew that he he knew how broke the guy was. Um, and, you know, and he'd been hanging out with these uh, Aryan Nations guys who, again, most of whom were caught. And it's, it's very bizarre and it's very, very tragic uh, it was you know, when when I wrote the article about Ruby Ridge for Ammo.com, which I hope people go and read and will link to in the show notes. You know, it's 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 really tragic because it's like you could be Randy Weaver. You know, you right. you listening to this podcast are are several steps closer to to being Randy Weaver than you probably think that you are. Um, and that's 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 kind of. It, you know, um, so yeah, and then the sequel to this is the siege at Waco, um, where there's a lot of evidence that Waco was the, I mean, it was called Operation Showtime, first of all, but there was, and they had been working with the local media to kind of get some, you know, um, amped up publicity right and if it's funny, if you watch the like, I always, whenever I do these things, I always watch the uh, movie of the week, you know, the a- ABC movie of the week, Siege yeah, at Mount, what was made for TV. Si- Siege at Mount Carmel <laughs> ripped from the headlines. And so you get to see like, you know, the dad from the wonder years, like being this really benign <laughs> ATF agent. Who's just like, I just want to get some more publicity so we can keep kids off drugs. Kind of like, you know, portrayal of the, the ATF. And like, all, all, you know, if you watch the one about the weavers, it's like, randy randy quaid and lord dern and like the the um the leader of the bad cops from the police academy movies like these are gold and everybody (laughs) should watch them 
Uh, but anyway, yeah. So there's Waco. Um, you know, I have vivid memories of Waco because it came to a close when I was on um, spring break. In yeah. well, and it was nationally. It was it was put on TV. Where like right? No, I was like, watching was this. Literally, like, I was watching like, this while live. it happened. <laughs> Yeah, I was yeah. watching this while it happened. I was I was home from school. Uh, I believe it was a Friday. Uh, I believe it was a Friday, my fr- last day of my you know April break in seventh grade. And I was watching this when it happened. Um, Fifty-one day siege, eighty-two Branch Davidians, including women and children, gunned down or burned to death. And I believe that I don't I don't know if they let, even let the the, the like the little little kids out. Uh, so I don't want to go out on a limb and say there was, you know, infants, but yeah, there was infants who got gassed in there anyway. Um, yeah. and each of these was directly cited by Timothy McVeigh, uh, as radicalizing him, uh, on his, you know, road to attacking the federal building in Oklahoma city. I do not want to in any way suggest that the ATF are, or anyone else is responsible for the actions of Timothy McVeigh. Um, I do, I think that 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 is very a very dangerous line of thinking, um, and I certainly do not believe that any of the blame for the bombing of Oklahoma City, a federal building, rests at the foot of anybody but Timothy McVeigh uh, and his accomplices. However, I think that it is impossible to discuss. Um, the siege of Ruby Ridge and the siege of Waco without mentioning that, oh yeah, and by the way, this guy who blew up the federal building says this is says this is why he did it. Um, so yeah, again, I just want to be clear that like I, 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 I'm not laying any of the foot the blame for the Oklahoma City bombing at the foot of anyone but Timothy McVeigh and his accomplices. And this is not like, you know, a hand wavy thing to cover my behind or anything like this is actually what I believe. Um, so, you know, whatever, but I, I, I it, it has to be mentioned. Right. Timothy McVeigh is responsible for his own actions. Right. right? Absolutely. And, 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 you know, when somebody like that, who knows what could spur them, right. It could be anything, but it, it is notable that these overreaches uh, of the ATF, definitely according to him, his own uh, proclamation that, that's why he did what he did. Um, so I, I agree. I, you know, not condoning the behavior. Absolutely. Like, like you mentioned before, like Timothy McVeigh is not a hero. He killed children too. Right. Killed a whole um, lot of kids. He pulled, yeah. I, you know, like uh, I think that I know, I know that there's like a couple people out there listening to this who are like, Oh, you know, Timothy McVeigh, maybe not such a bad guy. Uh, Timothy McVeigh yeah. blew up a daycare center guys. Um, so, you know, whatever you think about Bill Clinton blowing up aspirin factories, uh, you know, maybe, maybe, yeah. maybe put Timothy McVeigh in the same category. Um, yeah. But anyway, we're not going to say he's like Tyler Durden blowing up. <laughs> yeah, he's not Tyler know, Durden credit card agency making, <laughs> making smiley faces or anything uh, in buildings. Yeah. But um, so, you know, this is I think for anyone kind of my age ish, this is how you know about this is like why you've even heard of the ATF because they were very okay. reined okay. in around eighty six. Um, or there was an attempt to rein them in around 86 and, um, you know, this, yeah, then they did these crazy things, right? And then you hear about them because they're, they're on the front lines of these two sieges, which Ruby Ridge, I only knew, knew about, um, I couldn't even tell you the first time I heard of Ruby Ridge. I mean, it would have been sometime oh, when I, yeah. sometime when I was in high school, but it wasn't like, it, it was not the same thing as Waco. Cause like right. Ruby Ridge was not you know, on CNN at noon on a Friday or whatever it was. Um, this, yeah. this, and, and, this yeah. was, and that's how people know who they are. And then again, after, um, <clears throat> you know, after the, um, uh, you know, the, the, after the siege of Ruby Ridge and the siege of Mont Carmel, um, they, again, there's like, you know, there are some attempts to kind of rein this, rein this organization in to kind of pr- provide some accountability. I mean, I'm not trying to, to trying to hand wave away what obviously was a lot of, um, you know, 
I don't know, like the, the federal government protecting its own. Um, as I said, when we did the Waco podcast, I would urge everybody to go on YouTube and um, see uh, Chuck Schumer in action during these hearings. I mean, mm-hmm. if you want to see a guy who is if you want to see the type of person who's defending the ATF uh, and their actions at Waco and, you know, I believe also the FBI, um, go look at Chuck Schumer, um, who I'm sure everybody listening to this thinks is a hell of a guy anyway but you should go watch this because i just like it was astonishing to me as somebody who had a very low opinion of chuck schumer to begin with to to find that i could to find that he could become even further degraded in my eyes by watching his testimony (laughs) um at the hearings about waco um so anyway they, there's some accountability and what whatever, but but what happens right. between now and be, between then and now, nine yeah. eleven, then it's just a 9/11. bonanza and a feeding frenzy. Any three letter agency is like, you need money, we got terrorists to fight, buddy. Here you go. So, oh, um, I think this is when they. I think this is when they. Uh, get explosives is after 9-11 because this is when they I think you're right. This is when they like so there's got to be at least one person out there who has brushed up against the ATF because they're in amateur rocketry. So the fuels that are involved in amateur rocketry are now, you know, under the jurisdiction of the ATF. I'm sure they've never abused that power. Um, And there's kind of this Again, I don't know how true this is, but there's a perception anyway among f- some people in federal law enforcement that the ATF is kind of like it's almost like a short man syndrome. Like they they have a they have a kind of perception that they're made up of FBI rejects, and I don't I'm not speaking to whether or not that's actually true. I'm just saying that there's a certain reputation that they have that the ATF is made of a bunch of guys who couldn't hack it in the in the FBI or couldn't make it into the FBI uh, or washed out of the FBI or whatever. And so they don't cooperate with the FBI. They're constantly fighting with them. If any time something blows up, they want to fight over whether or not it's a terrorism investigation or an explosive or, or, or an arson. Um they thought that this was that this was gonna you know kind of settle down when they moved ATF over to justice, uh, and so at least they're in the same department. But that didn't really seem to um, do much. And there's not really any federal guidelines about if there's a terrorist attack involving explosives, who gets to uh, who gets the collar, who gets the investigation. There's not really any clear guidelines on that so there's this rivalry between the i mean there's like all these alphabet agencies are like fraternities they're constantly you know fighting with each other about who gets to do this and who gets to do that but i guess there's like a particularly bitter thing between the atf and the fbi um in part because the atf kind of has this inferiority complex and the fbi looks at them as like yeah buddy you couldn't hack it in the real you know federal law enforcement agent so you got to go you know, and trap rednecks into selling you sawed off shotguns. Um, And I do not use redneck pejoratively. I think rednecks are great. So, um, but in any event, um, and so they're given all these expanded police powers after 9-11, like everyone else. uh, And of course there's new alphabet agencies created, like my favorite buddies in the DMV Gestapo, the TSA, um, who we have a whole thing about on ammo.com resistance library and how you know big surprise you're more likely to be robbed by them than uh prevented from being blown up but in may 2004 through august 2005 that we know of because it's always important to, to point out when the federal government gets caught doing something wrong that was probably not the first time that they did it and quite possibly when they say they stopped doing it was not when they stopped doing it. Um, So anyway, yeah, they didn't get caught the first time. (laughs) First time they did this is not, not when they got caught. Um, They were working with local, local smokies down in Richmond, Virginia to harass and intimidate otherwise legal gun buyers, Uh, eight different gun shows. People were approached by officers and discouraged from buying weapons by officers 
gun salesmen were targeted, interrogated, and cu- accused of doing business without a license. Buyers were detained without charge. Their homes were visited by ATF agents. Again, this is all for uh, exercising a constitutionally protected right. Very important, again, to remember that. Uh, there was an ATF letter that demanded the presence of buyers to appear before the ATF and explain their totally legal gun purchases. This is not that that people were – this was not, you know, hey, buddy, we noticed that you made an illegal gun purchase. I'm sure you didn't mean to do that. Let's work it out. This was, hey, you made a legal, legal gun purchase. Um, come before our little kangaroo court and justify it to us. Uh, they were – Around also around this time, visiting the homes of buyers from a specific Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania gun show, demanding to see papers and arresting people who refuse to comply, uh, which I can't see why they would have to comply with that. Um, If a police officer showed up at my door and demanded paperwork for my truck, I would tell them to get bent and, uh, I would imagine that awesome. they have every back? legal and constitutional right to do the same to the ATF asking about their guns. And then this is all lead up to Operation Gunrunner, which is what everybody knows as the Fast and Furious scandal. It's because um, a bunch of these – it actually has that name because a bunch of these guys in one of the offices, I forget which, uh, they had like a car racing club or something stupid. Um but anyway, there, this was an official policy to allow certain illegal weapons purchases to go through between 2006 and 2011, um, not out of any desire, of course, to protect average citizens who maybe tripped up and uh, went afoul of the law in a way that they did not intend to, um, but to, in theory, catch bigger fish uh, higher up the food chain. Uh, that didn't really work. But it did lead to the death of a Border Patrol agent, uh, and some of the weapons were even used in the Paris attacks that I believe were in 2015 or 2016. I forget which. Um, and, the th- and the thing is, you know, er- this is another thing that everyone – this the, like, when we talk about Waco, we talk about Ruby Ridge, we talk about Fast and Furious, you know, these are just kind of the highest – um, the most publicized ones of these, um, bet a lot of people didn't know about the harassment of gun buyers. And I bet even fewer people knew this is the weirdest one and, and may, and maybe the most despicable, but it's difficult. Like when you have all these, it's like, how do you decide which is the worst? Cause they're all pretty bad, but they were like harassing Hmong refugees, uh, I believe in California. And for those who don't know, the Hmong are um, an ethnic group from Cambodia who um, who I know of because I grew up around a lot of people from – there's a lot of Cambodian uh, – there's a large Cambodian immigrant population, not just in the area where I grew up, but in my town. Uh, because if you know anything about how like immigration patterns work, it's like one – I don't know how it happens, but one guy comes to a town and just – you know, phones home and says, "Hey, everyone, I move. I live. I live here now, and it's a pretty nice town. And everybody come here." Well, my hometown that I grew up in uh, was, you know, the town that the the Hmong decided to move to. Uh, there was like two towns in New England and one in California. Mine was one of the two in New England. So they were refugees from, you know, from the Khmer Rouge. Uh, real nasty guys, obviously. And they're refugees from them. And um, so they, you know, were – no, I'm sorry. That's not correct because they were, they were, they were refugees from Laos in this case. Um, in this specific case, they were, they were Laotian refugees of the Hmong ethnicity, not Cambodian um, refugees. But anyway, the ATF was selling them illegal weapons. Uh, and it was like <laughs> – it was so they were selling them all these weapons that were supposed to go back to Laos, where, um, you know, which first of all is still many people don't know this because whoever thinks about Laos, but um, you know, Laos is still a com has still has a communist government, 
and the elderly and infirm men, which is like, you know, how think about how old a guy has to be to have fled the communist regime of Laos in the 70s or 60s or whenever they did it. I believe Laos has been communist since the early 70s, but I could be wrong about that. Um, there, these are elderly and in many cases infirm men, and they were buying, they were being entrapped into buying weapons by the ATF, um, illegal weapons that they were, you know, I doubt any of them actually ever hit the ground in Laos, but the theory was that they were selling these guys weapons that were going to go to Laos and the, the, the planned, um, use of these weapons was not like, oh, we're going to, you know, rise up and overthrow the Laotian government. It was like, we're going to arm Hmong tribesmen so that they can be less harassed by the, um, Laotian government, um, you know, and, and I say it's the, the most despicable, probably not because it objectively is, but because I, I have known a bunch of these people growing up and it's, you know, really disgusting to me that they would entrap a bunch of old Hmong men, um, who are just kind of trying to do right by their people back home. Um, the judge dropped all the charges, told them they had no case lasted four years and cost tens of millions of dollars. Uh, as you would imagine with elderly and infirm men, there were, um, there was a lot of deteriorating health among these guys. I mean, if you think about your father, um, you know, my father is 70 years old, um, or your grandfather, if he's closer to that age, having to deal with a frivolous criminal prosecution in his old age. Um, that's what was going on with these, these these poor guys but also horrible and a thing that people don't know much about was the time that the atf entrapped mentally disabled teenagers and coerced them into getting neck tattoos um yeah yeah, yeah. talk about talk about the neck tattoos like i don't I, like i read this sam and i was it boggled me like i was kind of dumbfounded like like this is a joke right it seemed i mean like absurd. It I mean, absurd if you want to me. talk about so, go like, ahead. Yeah. Uh, uh, <clears throat> so like you asked earlier, what's the, yeah. like, what do you think that they, you know, some of this is in good faith or whatever. I, again, I'm not a mind reader, but I would not be surprised if the neck tattoo thing was so that these guys could have a laugh around the office. I would not be yeah, surprised right? at all. <laughs> Um, because it's like, it's this, it's this kind of like cheap frat boy hazing kind of thing that I would completely expect, uh, from a federal law enforcement agency, particularly one with this with the weird inferiority complex that the ATF seems to have. So they opened up a fake, they opened up a fake bong store to entrap people, uh, which is like, you can't make this stuff up people. <laughs> um, and they entrapped a 19 year old mentally disabled drug addict manipulated him into getting the logo for this fake business tattooed on his neck and you gotta sit down people because you ain't gonna believe how they justified this in court what their explanation for why they why they told this guy to get a neck tattoo was um, they told the judge that it was because they told the judge that it was to maintain their cover. So, so that like, they looked legit. So that they looked legit. They stay made a kid get his neck tattooed. Um, the judge kept the judge didn't to his credit did not let them off the hook about this. He kept very pointedly asking, "How on earth suggesting that someone else get a neck tattoo was a method of protecting?" agent cover uh the atf was ordered by the judge to pay for the removal of the tattoo and um but this is not the only time that the atf has used what it refers to as low iq informants uh there was another case <laughs> just the that, kind we want to hire <laughs> right i mean it's like yeah it's um i think i believe that there's a that there is a positive correlation between um low IQ and being like bullied into a th bullied by authority figures into lying. 
Um, I believe yeah. that th- I could be wrong about that, but I believe that there is an actual proven statistical scientific correlation between low IQ and s- like susceptibility to being bullied into, um, you know, lying to an authority figure. I believe that I learned that during when I was following the the trial of the West Memphis three, the kids in uh, Arkansas who got like, you know, railroaded for murder 25 years ago or something. Um, but in any event, another aspect of the ATF that people are not going to be surprised to hear is that um, they're constantly losing stuff. I mean, they lost, they got audited yeah. in 2008 and they lost 76 weapons and 418 laptops. Um, well, yeah. I mean, even, even in both of the big cases, Ruby Ridge and Waco, there's complete incompetence. Um, things go missing. Evidence gets tampered with, you know, they, they claim innocence, but you know, we talked about the door. It's hard to lose a door. Um, it's hard to lose a laptop. It's hard to How lose many a laptop. Laptops I've have never you lost, lost in one. Your life? Zero. Yeah. I've lost a door, never lost a laptop. Um, yeah. So the, they're just incompetent. Um, I actually have, uh, I'm, I'm going to skip ahead in my notes here, but I actually have this stat that you, um, you talk about uh, that in a two year period, 400 ATF employees filed formal complaints ag- against the agency. Um, and what makes that so astounding is that the agency only employs 5,000 people. So that's like one, that's like one out of every 12 and a half people are complaining um, about how things are managed. Um, so yeah, I think account of, uh, competency is an issue with the ATF, um, for sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, but- so kind of, you know, pulling this back to something a little manageable, uh, because we're running up against time here, you know, yeah. I think that it's very, I think it's, it's worth kind of touching on again, you know, the Trump administration actually cut their funding. Um, they didn't just, you know, freeze it, um, like every other alphabet agency, which was supposedly a totalitarian nightmare when, according to liberals, when George Bush was president, um, you know, the ACF is great now, like the FBI and the CIA, uh, and they're very upset that he's done this. Um, but you know, they got, they have an astounding number even of, of internal complaints. Um, so I think that, you know, back to the question of like, is it corruption? Is it, is it incompetence? Uh, is it just that their mission is flawed? You know, I think it's kind of all of the above. I think that there's probably a number of corrupt agents. I think it's probably that there's a number of, um, uh, you know, lazy agents. I think that there's, yeah. but I think that there's probably you know, a number of committed agents who wanted, who think that they're doing right and just aren't. Um, and that's where you get, you know, 400 employee complaints within a two year period in a, um, in a, in a, uh, for an organization that has 5,000 employees, uh, the ATF has been accused of making threats of rape and murder against ATF agents and their families when, Good faith reports of conduct of corruption and misconduct occur. There's an entire group um, called Cleanup ATF. Um, you know, so I think that that it's you know important to remember that there's there are people within this organization who are not kind of out to get you and who would like to be able to just do their jobs, um, but are seem to be bumping up against uh, ma- widespread. Uh, corruption within the organization. And of course, anytime you say like somebody accuses somebody, it's like, there's an element of, you know, well, I could accuse you of anything. It doesn't, you know, an accusation by itself doesn't mean anything, but I think it's worth mentioning that there's this kind of, you know, reform organization uh, with it uh, comprised of uh, ATF agents, Um, you know, and there was also there. I think, um, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Well, I was going to say along those same kind of lines, I think with the ATF, um, some things happen and then like they just, uh, rogue is not necessarily the right word, but like let word, but let's talk for a moment. Uh, I think I have they this are my notes. I think it's important. I will, use, I will the, use that. Yeah, word. Let's talk about the slush fund. Let's talk about the slush fund and how like this became their policy. This became their norm. And it 
wasn't legal, right? It's, right. So why don't uh, so why don't you talk real quick about Thomas Lesnick and and the ATS slush fund, um, just so we can so our listeners can kind of get a grasp of. It's not always. It wasn't always overbounds in out in in the public like it was with Ruby, Ruby Ridge and Waco and even the Fast and the Furious, which we didn't even talk about. But um, like their policies in house were bad and unethical. So go ahead, I, I'll stop about yeah, that. Yeah, I mean they were <laughs> like on the slush fund. They were using another one of their shell shill businesses. Uh, this one was cigarettes. They were selling cigarettes. Um. You know, they were selling illegal cigarettes. Um, were they selling illegal cigarettes? Is that actually how it worked? Um, they were. Um, I, so I think they were. I think so. From what I, the research I did is kind of like the Fast and the Furious, right? For those of the listeners that don't know, uh, Operation Gun Runner, uh, on a real quick rundown, the ATF decided to let guns walk that were illegal in the hopes that they could trace those guns and bring down some some big guys. Um, the problem was they couldn't trace those guns. So I, from what I understand with the slush fund, um, track it. So illegal cigarettes is a big money maker. Maybe people don't realize you had mentioned earlier about how much tax money is involved in cigarettes. If you're from a big city in, in the Northeast, so- you know that cigarettes is big, is big money. Because anywhere, anywhere the mob yeah, right? operates, like, illegal cigarettes are you can get cigarette- big yeah. money. You can get them. So that's how this started, right? I think they were trying to track some cigarettes. They get some cigarette companies involved and start letting cigarettes walk in the hopes of bringing down somebody bigger. That sounds that sounds about um, right. Um, yeah, and they were keeping the money from it in a personal account uh, belonging to the owner of the business, which is called Big South Wholesale. And Congress did not have any oversight over this um you know and, from and what I, I understand they didn't even know about it no they didn't even know about it and there was no like it was just it became routine like everyone in the organization knew if you needed money for something you didn't go to congress you called what was his name um what was uh, lesnack's name uh thomas was his yeah, first thomas name. lesnack you called thomas lesnack in the bristol virginia office if you needed money for anything um millions Millions, millions moved through this account all without and it wasn't just go ahead yeah it was all without any kind of oversight um you know and the it ACF was notified no the, one was prosecuted no one was reprimanded yeah. uh lesnack re- they actually they, go ahead lesnack retired, retired and yeah. I, there's no indication that he didn't receive his full pension um you know, they, and they use some of this money not just for their own needs, like their own slush fund. They were they would bribe people in these cigarette cases to plead guilty instead of taking it to court, and then pay them off with this money. Yeah, well, Sometimes one guy wasn't testified a whole he lot. was paid a hundred bucks, hundred yeah. bucks a month is apparently the cost of getting somebody to plead guilty, uh, plus the rent yeah. on his house when he was in jail, plus a first class plane ticket to fly to plead guilty to his charges. So yeah, it's 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 um. It's very strange. I mean, I'm sure I'm sure that there's, you know, similar stuff kind of going on everywhere, but um I can't it can't be that like the ATF is constantly getting caught doing it because they're unlucky. <laughs> uh yeah, there's and right? it's just it, like it's kind of speaks to the whole you know issue of like who is actually watching these guys? Like who's the Right. Who is who is who, who's you know, policing the ATF and what they do. And that's why I think, you know, I think the slush fund is a really good example of, of, you know, the ATF as rogue agency. I don't think that it's some, you know, the, the liberal take on why Trump cut the, why the president cut the um, funding is like, well, you know, he's, he's against, um, he's against, uh, you know, gun control. And that's why he did it. And it's like, you know, I, 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 uh, I will just come out and say it. I love the president, but he is not <laughs> some kind of, you know, uh, gun freedom warrior by any stretch of the imagination. Um, right, I right. strongly suspect that he would, you know, if he thought it wouldn't um, impact his electoral numbers, I think he would probably cut some deal to ban assault weapons if he thought he could get away with it um i agree you know because and i don't think it's anything about you know he's some kind of like 
uh, vindictive anti-freedom guy i just think it's he has the mindset of a of a of a new yorker about it um you know that's i, I think it's as simple as that but i also getting back to the point i think it's foolish to say that you know the president is cutting their funding because he wants um people going all leroy jenkins with their with their guns out in the out in the sticks um i think it's because the atf is becoming increasingly impossible to um control and I think that there is a knowledge even among those in Washington that, um, you know, they're, that they're not, that they're out of control. I mean, there's, there's been, I think twice, um, Rep, representative James Sensenbrenner, he was a Republican from Wisconsin. I don't believe that he is still in the Congress though. Someone can correct me. Um, he, he has, I believe twice voted to break them up. Um, and so, you know, weapons, arson, explosives, and terrorism go to the AT, go to the FBI, and alcohol and tobacco smuggling goes to the DEA. Makes sense, right? I mean, it's right. like I don't understand why there needs to be a specific organization to, um, you know, patrol these things that actually have nothing in common and are actually just kind of together because there's a because of some weird some weird you know, quirk of, of, of Byzantine bureaucratic, um, reshuffling over the course of 130 years or whatever, which is really why they have jurisdiction over, um, what, what they do, uh, Sensenbrenner, and I hope I'm saying that correctly, said the FBI is a largely duplicative scandal ridden agency that lacks a clear mission. It is ba- plagued by b- backlogs, funding gaps, hiring challenges, and a lack of leadership. For decades, it has been branded by high-profile failures. There is also significant lap- overlap with other agencies. Without a doubt, we can fulfill the role of the ATF more efficiently. Um, and I would like to kind of spin off of that to make what is going to be my final uh, sprint here. We're going to go a little over. This is going to be a little long one, but I don't think anybody will mind. Um, imagine if you will, there was, I think a 14 month period, uh, might've been a full two years, but in any event, um, you know, imagine it's 2009 and you've got Barack Obama in the white house and you've got the 111th Congress, uh, where, you know, Democrats control both houses of Congress and the executive branch, um, particularly given how um, there's a kind of like bloodlust in federal American politics now that there wasn't Mm -hmm. 12 years ago to get the other side. Uh, Imagine, if you will, that being the political landscape And the new Democratic president, um, you know, says, you know what? We're not going to wait around for um, we are not going to wait around for Congress to pass a bill about assault weapons, though they certainly could have done so. Um, We're just going to use the ATF to go after people, Um, you know, imagine the ATF leaning on payment systems. Um, to disclose who's buying weapons. Um, you know, that I think is, um, is, imagine the ATF used to just kind of lean on the, on the gun market and put a chilling effect on, um, uh, buying weapons. They don't make them illegal, but they just make it, you know, not worth the trouble. Um, I think that that is very much worth considering when you think about, the ATF and what they could possibly do if there were a, um, you know, a government which really wanted to move against private ownership of firearms, how could they use the ATF against you without passing a single law? Um, Particularly with, as I think will become a theme throughout the Resistance Library podcast, uh, the rampant delegation of legislative power from the actual legislature to these alphabet bureaucracies uh, that, you know, are just kind of given free reign to 
regulate as they see fit the things that are supposedly under their jurisdiction. I don't think that this is really, I don't think this is crazy talk. You know, I think no, this I'm, is very much within yeah. the realm of possibility. Well, and you even discuss in your article, uh, we didn't talk about it here just because there's so much to, to talk about, but uh, with the Beltway sniper um, and the ATF went through Virginia and took what, so, so just a, a quick, how things work when you buy a gun, you have to fill out a form uh, 4473, which is an ATF form. And that's what your background checks based on. And after those background checks are done, background checks are not um, a gun registration system right? They're, they're not supposed to be, they're not supposed to track. So the, the gun seller, the guy who has the FFL, he keeps those forms in a box somewhere in his gun shop. And if his gun shop closes down, he sends them to the ATF. Well, when this, uh, during the Beltway Sniper, when they were looking for this guy, they collected these forms throughout from FFLs throughout Virginia and we're using them like gun registrations. Well, these are the people we know that have bought guns and what do we know about them? Um, I, I think it's, um, we need oversight, right? That's that's why the forefathers wrote the Constitution the way they did, right? Um, and I think, uh, yeah, I think, I think, I think rogue is right, right? I like tried to not use that word. Um, I think it's, I think it's interesting. I did uh, in my research prepping for the podcast. Um, I just put an ATF in my Google search and went to news and I got um, a couple different articles that are happening right now in I want to say in Michigan. Um, let me check my notes to make sure I don't get this wrong. Um, it was Michigan. Michigan has both medicinal and recreational cannabis. Um, so, but Michigan also doesn't use the federal NICS background check system. They use a state system. There's a handful of states that don't use um, the federal system. And that's the state's right, as long as they're doing background checks. Um, but yeah, so now the ATF is going to FFL places in Michigan, um, putting pressure on them to not use the state system but demanding that they use the federal NICS system. Um, and, and this isn't an attempt to try and not allow cannabis, you people who are using cannabis recreationally or medicinally to not be allowed to use guns because of course, cannabis is still um, federally a schedule one um, drug. So just interesting that they're still today, like trying to kind of be bullies out there and, you know, trying to tell, the FFL that they have to use federal systems when they don't have to use federal systems. It's their right to use the state system. It's the state's designation of what they use for background checks. Um, just, you know, they're still out there. They're still kind of pushing their weight around. I am going to go on record as saying that I don't think the ATF will exist by the end of the decade. Oh God, I, 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 hope I don't think they will. <laughs> um, because I, I just, I, I think that, you know, it's, it's extremely unusual for any federal bureaucracy to constantly be facing uh, being dismantled or having their budget cut. And I, I do think that they're like one more high profile, you know, it's got to be something on the level of fast and furious, yeah. you know, someone's got to die. It's probably going to have to be a, be a, a, another federal agency for anyone to take notice. Um, but they're going to, they're going to screw up again. And it's kind of going to be the end of the line for them. Now, it doesn't mean that their, you know, their 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 duties won't get handed off to some other, um, you know, alphabet agency that may be just as bad, if not worse. Um, but I will be surprised if, if you know, in twenty thirty, we're still talking about the ATF because I just I think that even, you know, kind of what you would, what you might call good government conservatives are kind of going to have trouble. Um, continuing to justify the existence of the ATF um, given how scandal plagued it is and how the, um, you know, there's just, there's other agencies who do what they're supposed to be doing. Um, yeah. So I, I don't know that they're much longer um, for this, for this world, but you know, we'll, we'll see. Uh, well, and yeah, that's probably, and, and you know, an agency that is, constantly associated with words like restless, aggressive policies, entrapment, evidence cover-up, uh, overreach, lack of accountability, rogue. Like, that, that's not, those aren't things that we need. Right. <laughs> those right. aren't, you know. Um, so I, I hope you're right. I hope, um, I th and I think I think maybe you are. I think there is, um, I, uh, I hope to see in the next decade a, a push for 
um, like you said, common sense conservatives pushing for less government, smaller, you know, more things that are easier to oversee. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure about it, how it'll all play out, but I hope you're right. Uh, so Sam, we, we, we are running a little over here. Any, anything else you want to talk about the ATF? Um, we have lots of, a lot of the stuff we've talked about, Ruby Ridge, Waco, even Fast and the Furious, which we didn't really cover. Um, we've got uh, lots of documents on that stuff in the recess resource library on ammo.com. So please check them out. I will make sure they get listed in the, um, in the about for this episode of the podcast. And but you know Sam, what, you have any what last else word? you need to put in the about is that uh, I have a, I have a Twitter now. If people would like Ooh. to follow me, mm-hmm. uh, I took, they had to hold me at gunpoint in the ammo.com <laughs> offices. But um, I, I can be found at Sam Jacobs, 45 at twitter.com. And um, yeah, I don't really have anything else to say about the ATF. It's like, you want to not talk, talk about the ATF for an hour. Jeez, it's grim stuff. Right. Uh, hey, Sam, why the 45? That's how that's how your core profile is, too. You know. Does it represent anything or is I it just know. the number that you made it for me? Because <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't carry, I was, I I don't carry to, 45, yeah. so that's not <laughs> nothing to do with that. And they made it for me. But, uh, yeah. Oh, well, uh, thanks for tuning in, everyone. And uh, we'll see you next week. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, as I mentioned, if you want to know more about the ATF, please head to ammo.com. Check out Sam's newest article that went live end of February. Um, our resource library is filled with wonderful um, articles that will help you um, defend civil liberties. Uh, and as always, if you're interested in some good ammo deals, check out ammo.com backslash podcast where we have a special deal just for our listeners. We'll talk to you all next week. Mm-hmm.